Hello and uh, good evening. Uh, I would like to welcome everyone in South Africa and in Germany and wherever they are in the world on behalf of the Konrad Adenauer Foundation. My name is Henning Suhr. I'm the current representative of the Konrad Adenauer Foundation in South Africa. And with me is also uh, Hans-Werner Busmann, the chairperson um, from the DESA4 in its abbreviation, the German South African Forum. Um, and of course, the panelist, which Mr. Busmann will um, introduce after my welcoming. Um, South Africa and Germany are two big economic powerhouses in their respective continents. And obviously, they also have uh, very vital and interesting bilateral relations, uh, it not only regarding the economy, but also we have a lot of cultural or um, uh, cultural relations in academia, lots of cooperation. But today we would like to focus especially on the, the bilateral cooperation on multilateral, um, uh, multilateral, um, uh, and multilateral, um, sorry, um, level. Um, Germany is currently um, the, holds the presidency of the European Union and is also a non-permanent member of the United Nations Security Council. South Africa, on the other hand, holds the presidency in the African Union and is also a non-permanent member uh, in the United Nations Security Council. And I think that here, not only during the last one year and a half, but some months are uh, still left to see what is the current, what are the current states of the uh, of the joint efforts they have, what are the challenges, and also maybe wh where we might have in the future. Um, uh, some, some better perspective of uh, cooperation. With these words um, and no further delay, I would like to hand over the word to Mr. Busman, but before I do that, I just would like to say something about the house rules. Um, despite the fact that it's a digital event uh, online, we also have some house rules. We have the chat box on the right-hand side. This uh, chat box, or if you, you can open it uh, on the bottom of your screen, in this chat box, it's purely for technical questions in case that you have problems uh, uh, with the connection and my colleagues in Berlin, they are going to help you, or at least try to help you. Uh, then we have the Q&A box, uh, which you also can find in the bottom, uh, where we are going to ask all the questions to the panelists. And uh, I will do my best to, to catch up uh, all, all the questions we have in the limited time uh, which is uh, disposable. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. And now I would like to hand over to Mr. Busman. Ah. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the board of the German South African Forum, I would uh, like to extend a very warm welcome to all of you. And I'm pleased and honored to welcome Ambassador Sizani. Excellent to see you. We are very glad to have you with us tonight on the panel, as well as uh, Elizabeth Sideropoulos from the South African Institute of International Affairs and uh, Dr. Melanie Müller, who is an African expert in the German Institute for Security and International Affairs, as well as uh, Dr. Oswald, who is Director General in the German Ministry of Development Cooperation. I also welcome Ambassador Dolger, who is the Commissioner for Africa in the German Foreign Office. And uh, in addition to all of that, we are very pleased and honored to have Dr. Mrs. Dagmar Freitag with us. She is the Chair of the Committee for Sport and member of the Committee on Foreign Relations of the Deutsche Bundestag, as well as Dr. Christoph Hoffmann, who is member of the Committee on Development Cooperation and uh, of the Parliamentary Advisory Committee on Sustainable Development of the German Bundestag. Last but not least, I would like to mention Mohamed Kasimi, the Deputy of the Ambassador and Minister at the South African Embassy in Berlin, who is leaving us in a fortnight and I want to use this opportunity to thank him for the good cooperation and wish him the level best for his future 
uh, work in the headquarters in Pretoria. I also would like to thank the Konrad Adenauer Foundation for the excellent cooperation in the preparation uh, of this event. Uh, all your team and on my side, Klaus Brückner, our executive, and uh, Peter Konze, member of the board of DESA4. Ladies and gentlemen, it's an immense pleasure to welcome such an impressive number of uh, particip virtual participants, both residing in Germany and South Africa. As Henning Suo has already indicated, we have developed over the last 25 years very strong bonds of friendship and cooperation. If I am not mistaken, uh, the binational commission we have with South Africa uh, has the highest number of subcommittees, and that is together with the high number of tourists, uh, people living, German people living in South Africa or visiting it for several months each year, and many other issues, a very impressive sign of this close cooperation. Tonight, however, we want to explore which, uh, which lesson can be learned of the cooperation between Germany as uh, the presidency of the European Union and South Africa as a presidency of the African Union, as well as those of us being non-permanent members of the Security Council of the United Nations until the end of the year, especially in view of what we can do together uh, to cope with the challenges lying ahead of us worldwide. So I look very much forward to this uh, panel discussion and I'm sure we have a very interesting evening and I hand over now to Henning Su again. You have the virtual floor. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Busman, and uh, we give you a virtual applause uh, for the welcoming remarks. I would like hand now the word to uh, His Excellency Ambassador Stone Zizani, who has been uh, ambassador to Germany already quite uh, quite a year, uh, quite quite a while, some years, and uh, I would like to ask you uh, to say in five to seven minutes uh, your um, view on the current state of uh, the German South African uh, um, relations. Uh, ambassador, the floor is yours. Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I would not uh, mention who is in the panel now because that has already been done. Let me get down to uh, what I'm asked to do here. Good evening in South Africa. I hope uh, you are not alone there, Elizabeth. Our understanding of the relationship between Germany and South Africa dates much further than just when President Mandela and uh, Chancellor Kohl met in 1996. The context of the South African economy and politics uh, also have to be brought into the context of this relationship between Germany and South Africa. However, tonight is not for that purpose, but I want everybody to understand that my uh, contribution tonight would be taking that into consideration. Since the beginning of uh, the CODESA uh, negotiations, it became very clear that the South African economy which was so small to cater only for the white uh, community in South Africa, needed to be broadened so that it can take care of all those people who were outside that economy at that particular time. And the president at that time, President Mandela, had to find friends who would be able to understand where we come from, where, who also would understand the pressure, political pressure on him to be able to find partners that will respond to the South African economic uh, demands. Even though the, the, the existing leadership at the time were specifically hoping that the reconstruction and development program, which on the left of the spectrum, political spectrum in South Africa, thought that it was going to be uh, growth via uh, development so that it can cover the development needs of the rest of the population 
was going to be the driving program of the government of the time. Hence, the, the first uh, uh, arrangement was to hire a specific minister in the office of the president as a trade unionist who understood exactly what the needs of the workers and the rural poor would be in order for them to be brought onto the mainstream of the economy. Uh, unfortunately, at that time, the, the, the economy was not going to be structured in a way that the reconstruction and development program would allow that to happen in the five years of the period of Madiba's presidency. And the signing of that constitution at that time uh, by the Con South African Constituent Assembly meant that all South Africans were clamoring for all those needs that they needed to have met because of the period they, they were outside that system. And Madiba had to tour the whole world to find those partners who will be able to assist the South African uh, society to be able to respond to this. And President Mandela met uh, uh, Chancellor Kaur and they agreed on a systematic relationship that will allow them to be able to respond to the needs of the South African economy at the time. But I need to draw the panelists uh, to their attention of, of the fact that the South African point of departure at that time was not purely economic response to the South African economic problems, but also was to make sure that in line with the uh, collapse of the Berlin Wall, the East and West uh, Cold War arrangements will not catch South Africa napping in its response politically, even though the economic requirements needed uh, to be met in the manner in which the South African government needed. And therefore, the, pres the president structured the BNC to be able to create a capacity in the South African economy that would allow us to be able to embrace German companies. Anybody who looks at that agreement between the two countries will notice that it was, its purpose was to facilitate trade and investments, the development of the capacity of the South African business to grow, the skilling of the South African citizens to expand research, innovation, technology, modernization of the manufacturing across all sectors of the economy. Hence, more than 600 German companies came to the South African uh, economy and they employed more than 100,000 uh, mostly skilled workers uh, to be able to participate in the growth of the South African economy. Together with many of the uh, South African businesses that were there at the time made the South Africa a very vibrant economy. Unfortunately, during that period, all commentators agreed that the growth that was experienced by the South African economy was a jobless growth, but it was growing. Hence the technology was replacing the, skill, the less skilled workers and more unemployment was created even though the economy was growing. Unfortunately, when Madiba left, there, there was a change in the approach in how the, the RTP was implemented. Most of the companies, uh, German companies that were in South Africa, who understood this, this for us is, a, is the most uh, important understanding of the German-South Africa partnership, that the German companies understood that to train and skill the workers is an investment. It is not a cost to the company, precisely because if you are staying ahead of the competition in, the, in your area of your, in the market, you are actually going to be able to have the cutting edge technology and your products will be in demand in the market. Unlike the traditional approach to South African economy, workers, uh, companies believed it is a cost that must be borne by the government. Hence, the economy and education in South Africa do not match. And precisely because of that problem, the many companies in South Africa are not competitive in the world other than their ability to produce the goods and services in the country where they come from.
And that is precisely one of the areas that the BNC seeks to respond. And unfortunately, not everybody has got a buy-in into this particular area of the, of the economy. There are many uh, government departments in Germany that are partnering directly with the South African departments. There are many institutes in Germany that are partnering with, for research and innovation with South African institutes. There are many universities and, and uh, states, uh, German states that are partnering with the South African uh, provincial governments. The unfortunate thing about these African, uh, South African uh, states, only the Western Cape that is regarded as the one that blends particularly very well with Bavaria uh, and in its ability not only to connect the businesses, but also to connect the administration so that the administration is uh, smoothly connecting with the ability of the companies to, to be met in terms of their needs and be able to skill the, the workers in a way that the administration is able to uh, augment the ability of the needs of the of the, the unfortunate thing, therefore, the Eastern Cape government, the KwaZulu government, and the Gauteng government, which are matching with uh, Niedersachsen and uh, Baden-Württemberg, use companies to do this rather than state to state. And this is one thing that South African government uh, is working on to respond so that the states will be able to connect with the states rather than leave that relationship in the hands of the private sector. It is in the multilateralism between the two states where a huge uh, impact has been achieved, up to, even though it is in the short term, uh, in, the, in the technical, political, and, and uh, uh, technical area of uh, globalization. The multilateralism, in the, especially when Germany has been in the United Nations Security Council as a non-member, a permanent member for the past six years, this six times this, this particular term, and South Africa for the third term. But they have mastered the, the, the ability to network in the Security Council and being able to put into practice their own uh, approach to a global uh, uh, new world order that will enable for peace, uh, the rule of law, the ability of states to be able to not go in alone, but work together in, in, in the demands of meeting peace of the world. The unfortunate thing though, that be, be, between this period, what, when they got back together, other states were even pushing more nationalism, more uh, uh, inward looking policies, other than what uh, South Africa and Germany and some uh, uh, and, and some uh, like-minded states are able to stay at a multilateral area. And South Africa uh, with Germany started with the G20 uh, compact with Africa to blend particularly closer so that the Africa and, and Germany and, and, and Europe in particular would be able to understand how the globe will affect them and therefore they must respond by working together in the, and use the facilities that were created by the G20 uh, compact with South Africa. And as, as uh, President uh, Ramaphosa was uh, uh, starting to be chair of the AU, that also enabled uh, President Ramaphosa working with Chancellor Merkel and in Germany created a platform where most of the heads of state that were particularly responsible for some uh, of the AU key tasks of uh, creating infrastructure, man uh, manufacturing, uh, industrialization of the continent, and making sure that clean governance, democracy is deepened, were facilitated in the, uh, in the debates that were ensuing between South Africa and Germany. It became very clear also that when President Ramaphosa's chairship of the AU was beginning to intervene in the processes 
of uh, uh, the, the great uh, Ethiopian uh, Renaissance Dam, problems between Ethiopia and Germany, uh, the negotiations were not going very well. And, and uh, when they were not moving well, it was the consultation between South Africa and Germany that enabled that process not to stall too much. Unfortunately, during that particular period, uh, Ethiopia had uh, internal issues that uh, bedeviled the negotiations between Egypt, Sudan, South Africa, South Africa facilitating that process were stalled. But um, then the Ambassador, Libya, Ambassador, sorry, I do not want to be impolite. Can you please uh, wrap up in order to give the other panelists also uh, sufficient time? Thank you. I, I will. Uh, I, I wanted to mention that uh, when the Libyan crisis also process was stalling, it was the consultation between South Africa and Germany uh, to make sure that that process started uh, again through the Berlin uh, conference. Even in the United Nations, between Germany and South Africa, the working relationship uh, became stronger when issues of the world with like-minded countries were being were stalled and big other countries were delaying uh, processes because we're focusing internally in their, in their internal matters. I am encouraged by the COVID uh, process between South Africa and Germany because the intervention between the, the two of them in the institutes that they use to make sure that they blend the processes that were developing of the COVID-19 benefited the whole of the continent precisely because of that working relationship. And I, I, I'm hoping that beyond the COVID, the economic collapse of uh, many countries in the continent working in the, in, the, in the relationship between the EU, Germany, South Africa, and, and uh, all the institutions of the continent will enable to facilitate between the G20, the EU, and the international uh, community to make those economies work. And that is why the strength of this relationship is encouraged. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador, and also a digital or virtual applause goes to you. That was very enlightening, and um, thank you very much for highlighting especially all the positive aspects of the bilateral relations. I would like now to uh, give the word to Dr. Oswald, um, who is um, uh, the head of department of the, uh, in the German ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development uh, and heading the, the Department Marshall Plan with Africa, uh, Refugees and Migration. He is uh, dealing with Africa since many, many times and especially with South Africa. We would like to welcome you and maybe you can say some words about uh, your perspective on the current affairs between South Africa and uh, Germany, including especially the, the BMZ uh, strategy, the strategy of your ministry. Um, 2030, um, which categorized South Africa also as a global partner. Um, the, wor uh, the word is yours. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sewer. It's also a pleasure to see a number of people whom I have not seen for months. Elizabeth, Melanie Müller, even Ambassador Cesani. Uh, uh, and it's very good uh, that we have the chance to be on one panel. Well, uh, I think uh, this year, besides uh, the pandemic, but also the pandemic uh, uh, led to uh, an, an intensified cooperation. But before the pandemic, uh, we, we noted, of course, the, the visit of our chancellor uh, early this year to, to South Africa which was certainly uh, a landmark uh, in, in the relations of the two countries. Just after that, uh, in, in, in March, already in the pandemic, we had uh, uh, our Binational Commission. And uh, I remember that uh, because I was also part of it. Uh, and uh, well, at, the, at that time we were, really at the beginning of having virtual meetings. It was a telephone conference. And uh, well, uh, it was uh, something special and we were not yet 
that much used to it, but it was functioning very well. <clears throat> Last week, uh, we had uh, our uh, bilateral government-to-government -government negotiations, uh, which, uh, well, if uh, we manage to sign the protocol and receive the final protocol, will uh, end up uh, in a pledge of 300 billion euro, which is, I would say, a strong signal. Probably you might be interested uh, that, uh, uh, to, to learn a bit uh, about the contents, uh, uh, the substance of these negotiations before I come uh, briefly on the new cooperation model. Well, apart from the commitments made, we focused uh, on discussions around priority areas and one important one is peaceful and inclusive society, certainly an issue which is of great importance also to South Africa. Uh, we have uh, another priority area called, called training and sustainable growth for decent jobs and responsibility for our planet, climate and energy. All three very significant issues uh, for uh, South Africa. Well, under the headline peaceful and inclusive societies, we summarized our concerns vis-a-vis -vis insufficient governance, measure, measures to be taken against corruption and possibilities to prevent violence and crime, especially gender-based violence. We have seen President Ramaphosa as a strong leader who was able to steer South Africa very well uh, uh, through the COVID crisis up to now with a very strong dedication and strength. Uh, and he really managed to, to prevent a much higher death toll. And we acknowledge these achievements as outstanding. Nonetheless, together with many civil society organizations and media representatives, uh, we expect the same leadership when it comes to the fight against corruption. We know there is something underway in, in the South African judicial system, and I think it is very important that these moves uh, also lead to uh, the, the mass, much probable results. To support our South African partners in their fight against corruption, we have jointly decided to focus our support to governance and to make transparency and integrity the cornerstones of our cooperation in this area. With regards to the prevention of violence, BMZ has decided to stay engaged in this area. I personally had the chance to visit the one or the other activities there, and that uh, looked very promising to me. Uh, we jointly came also to the conclusion to continue our work and link the topic of crime prevention with the topic of TNET. Perspectives for young people and additional early childhood care uh, are important issues. As the topic uh, TNET under the headline training and sustainable growth for these jobs have been discussed during the meeting of our bilateral commission thoroughly, uh, it was uh, not subject of our negotiations this time. Uh, and uh, the cooperation in the area of energy and climate is financially seen the biggest in volume. And I think also one of the key issues uh, uh, of uh, interest uh, to the South African uh, government. We can make use of the full range of our instruments uh, from technical cooperation to grants, loans, and development loans. Our joint goal is to support South Africa uh, in its energy transition, summarized under just transition, to a carbon-free society and economy. As a country which still relies heavily on coal, we know how painful this process is and what it entails, including the question of jobs, skills, and the economy of whole regions. As I'm also in discussion with the, uh, the government of North Rhine-Westphalia, and they have a partnership with Mpuma Langa, uh, I also proposed a closer cooperation in this area between Mpuma Langa and North Rhine-Westphalia, because uh, 
I consider it very important that, uh, let's say, a German federal state who already is went already through all these processes and still is going through those processes could be a good, uh, uh, well, partner to learn from and uh, to, to inject uh, uh, these uh, uh, experiences. In this regard, allow me to come short in the short model to our new cooperation on the BMZ 2030. Well, after the summary of our joint negotiations, uh, you might ask what's new? Well, everything sounds pretty familiar with regards to the previous cooperation. Uh, what about the new development cooperation strategy? Well, in one way you're right, and you're at the same time not right. Of course, we did not reinvent the wheel and we do not want to jeopardize our joint achievements. Development cooperation means change, but evolution, not revolution. Therefore, we do not do everything new and different, but keep what has worked well. The new model South Africa is grouped together with Brazil, Indonesia, and other emerging markets to the category of a global partner. So that's merely the G20 members and uh, a couple of others. As many global partners belong to high emission countries, especially uh, the cooperation with the aim to reduce greenhouse gas emissions is very crucial. And it is, let's say, a support to make happen what all those countries have agreed to when they signed the Paris Agreement. And uh, global partners mostly do not need classical development cooperation, but are more interested in knowledge transfer, science to science exchange, and policy discourse on global topics. To translate this overarching guiding principles in our cooperation with our South Africa, we have come to the following conclusions. The cooperation in the area of climate uh, uh, gas reduction. Uh, well, I have dwelled already on that uh, with regard to the result of our development cooperation negotiations. The very important issue to do that transformation job sensitive and uh, to take into account the necessity, uh, let's say, to upgrade the team system in South Africa into a system which is really uh, sought after by the clients, which is currently only the case to a very limited extent. And we have teamed up also uh, with the German companies, Ambassador Cesani mentioned in South Africa, Western in South Africa, uh, which offer also a very strong cooperation in this regard. Apart from this cooperation in the narrow sense, broken down, to projects and probably still South Africa as a strong democracy with a vibrant civil society. South Africa and Germany share many views on dem democracy and human rights. I think we have made use of this in international fora, but we can do better in the future. For the next COP in 2021, we encourage South Africa to come up with ambitious goals, nationally determined contributions. Concerning the questions of regional cooperation, continent to continent cooperation, the relevance of other actors in cooperation in multilateral fora, I think the discussion will uh, allow for further elaboration. Uh, it is, I think, very important uh, that we intensify, I think also the ambassador Zani dwelt on that, uh, well, to to see where we can join forces. And I think expectations on, on the South African AU presidency and the German EU presidency were a lot higher than what we were able to deliver uh, well, due to the, the pandemic. Other issues came uh, into the forefront. But I think there is a strong chance uh, to, to do more in this regard. Let's say also, uh, Mr. Busman uh, dwelt on the issue 
of uh, uh, quite a number of uh, German ministries cooperating with South Africa. It's not like in, let's say, the average African country that normally besides cultural affairs and a bit here and a bit there, uh, it's in other African countries, usually the BMZ is, uh, let's say, in the lead. But uh, in South Africa, we have a wide range of ministries being involved. And this is also making the nature of German-South African cooperation also in a way how we see it. I leave it with that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Oswald, and uh, like to the others, uh, virtual applause to you. Thank you very much for highlighting the focus areas of the bilateral um, relations, but also to say that maybe on multilateral level, there can be do more. And with this, I also would like to come to our next speaker, Elizabeth Sideropoulos, which I think does not need any further um, uh, introduction because anyone who uh, is interested uh, in South African foreign relations in some moment um, uh, comes to the name Elizabeth Sidropoulos, who is heading the South, uh, the think tank South, South African, um, uh, um, sorry, Institute for International Affairs, SAYA. Um, she also wrote recently a book, which I will show here, Values, Interests and Power on the state of the South African foreign policy. Elizabeth, I would like to ask you to give us your perspective on the South African foreign policy and um, also maybe to highlight um, in which parts do you think Germany and South Africa uh, are combining quite well, where they are in tune regarding their interests, their values and their power. Elizabeth. Right. Uh, thanks. Thanks very much, uh, Henning, and thank you uh, very much uh, both to CAS and to the uh, German South African Forum for the opportunity. Very good to see you, Ambassador. And uh, the same goes to Dr. Oswald and, 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 and Melanie and, of course, to, to Stefan. Uh, Henning, I saw very recently <laughs> uh, one of the rare occasions in the last nine months. Um, um, the, the, uh, let me start by, uh, by uh, sort of my introduction by really referring to the book and then bringing that around because I, I think Henning, you make a, a, a very important point. And, and the point is that the book was, the book that I co-edited with a colleague at the University of Pretoria was really intended to give some thought to what South Africa's foreign policy should look like in the 2020s. Didn't necessarily look at specific countries, but certainly it identified a number of themes. And one of the areas, <clears throat> that it highlighted at the, at the beginning was, was really to look at uh, the importance of what, what underpins uh, the way in which we engage in both our foreign policy, but also domestically. And of course, we argued that the constitution and the values espoused by the constitution are really not always what guide us in foreign policy, because we know that foreign policy is also very much about real politic, but should actually be the framework uh, uh, and, and the basis on, on which we engage, both bilaterally, but also, I think, importantly, in the way in which we uh, uh, engage in, in, in the multilateral sphere. And I think that that latter point is particularly important because we are at a, at a crossroads. And I know it's probably a hackneyed phrase to say it, but um, I, I think what we've learned uh, in, in, in accelerated tones over the last nine months is is how much our global governance system needs to be reformed. We've also learned that, in fact, uh, uh, some regions of the world are better uh, under crises at regional cooperation than perhaps others. And here I, I want to really, uh, uh, maybe I shouldn't be doing this uh, as a think tanker, but I think uh, the African continent really came to get together in a very significant way very early on to actually deal with the pandemic. And if we want to look at an example of regional cooperation, I think Africa is it. And I think it was really driven by the recognition that we actually had a lot to lose if we didn't do that. But, but multilateralism needs to be reformed. Um, and if we're going to reform it, we really need to identify some common ground. The first, the first step of that common ground is to identify common values, of course. And I, and I would argue that on many fronts, 
both South Africa and Germany, and more broadly the continent and, and, and the European Union, certainly in terms of what we espouse uh, uh, in, 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 in our declarations and in our statements, have share, share a number of, 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 of common values. And these are potentially useful if we're going to be looking at how we can agree together on what needs to change in the global governance system, because the global governance system needs a paradigm shift. It's not just about tinkering with the mechanics. It actually needs us to think about uh, the way in which our, our global economy and our global politics are structured in a, different, uh, in a different way. That also means that I think we also need to get out of uh, sometimes very specific uh, ways in which we position ourselves. And I think the important thing that will characterize the next decade is, is, is how we build new alliances on issues that are important. Um, so on issues that we can find common ground. I think the ambassador spoke about uh, like-minded uh, on, on certain issues. And I think that's, that's important. So it's a new world requires new alliances that I would argue cut across ideological divides. And again, I think we've seen, so and when I sometimes, when I talk about ideological divides, I also refer to the global South, global North. And I think some, are, some of our engagement as South Africa and Germany in, in, uh, at the UN Security Council has really focused on, on where we have found common ground and, and crossing that, uh, uh, bridging that, that gap or bridging that, um, that divide. Um, but it's also, and I think we have to recognize that, it's a far more geopolitical world at the moment. And that really means that, you know, we, we've seen a shift certainly in development cooperation. And I know that Dr. Oswald uh, uh, in, in the BMZ may have a slightly different perspective, but I think generally development discussions tend to become much more politicized and polarized because this is now they feed into the broader geopolitical narrative. Uh, whether it's about how we counter uh, China, if, if Europe is saying, you know, we need to counter the influence of China, or the US is saying the same, or the influence of Russia, and so on and so forth. And that does create, does that does make the entire uh, multilateral atmosphere in which we are operate, operating an environment a little bit more difficult, um, I think, and actually the opportunity to build, the, uh, to build bridges is so important. So countries like South Africa and Germany, um, um, I think, can play a seminal role here. And then lastly, before I then look specifically at some of the areas of, of, of cooperation moving forward, um, I think it's important that uh, we all recognize that while with still limited resources and still not fully uh, a coherent uh, uh, approach and positioning on multilateral issues, Africa has developed much more agency. And I think South Africa has played a critical role over the last 20 years in helping to, to build that up, A, through the establishment of, uh, through working and contributing to the establishment of a number of institutions, uh, but also through, uh, through our active role in that. And that's important because I think sometimes we find when we're in, in discussions with uh, with Northern partners, um, the, the, the tenor has changed because actually Africa and South Africa are putting things much more proactively on the table. And that sometimes uh, elicits a, a, a response which becomes defensive and sometimes difficult to, to move beyond that. And I think recognition of African agency um, is important. Let me then very quickly move to uh, two points that I, that I wanted to make. The first is uh, last week I was asked to reflect on, on some of the issues around North-South dialogue and why that's important in our, in our foreign policy. And I've identified three specific areas, and then I want to move to, to, to the region. And I think these specific areas are relevant for our discussion on the German-South Africa partnership. The first really is um, that it is critical for multilateralism if we are going to reform it, um, that we actually have this kind of discussion and dialogue, very frank and, and, and one that hopefully is based on a common and on an understanding of each other's positions. That's important. Secondly, and this um, I think touches on some of the issues around development cooperation, is that it is really, we now are in a position where we re need to rethink the development paradigm that places ODA at the center of, it, of, of, of development cooperation, but also creates sometimes 
uh, unnecessary uh, or or not necessarily well thought out divisions between middle income countries and low income countries. And here I speak specifically about some of the challenges that we see middle income countries facing and the COVID, we've seen it in the context of debt. Debt uh, forgiveness or debt uh, rescheduling has been really largely targeted at dealing with the low income countries uh, 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 problems. We also see it, for example, in the way COVAX is being rolled out again, much more specifically uh, targeted to LICs, less uh, uh, tailored for the, the needs of, of middle income countries. So that's something that really we need to be discussing. And I think that this is a, an important area for engagement. And lastly, then, uh, and this has been said often enough also by Dr. Oswald, the, the importance of transnational, transnational issue based engagement and specifically here issues of, of green transformation. Uh, because I know that Henning is going to tell me soon that I have to wrap up. Let me highlight a couple of um, areas where um, co collaboration with Germany, particularly around economic issues, is absolutely vital. And this probably to some extent just reiterates the points that have been made. But I think one of the lessons that we've learned coming out of COVID is the important, we're still in COVID, but anyway, is the importance of, of, of resilience in the region and building, particularly in Southern Africa. And South Africa is seriously constrained at, the, at this particular juncture to be able to do that. Uh, we're talking about rolling out continental free trade areas where the basis is regional value chains, but we ourselves as South Africa really are constrained in how we take that forward. And partnerships with countries and, and companies that have a strong presence in South Africa and in the region can actually play a very important role in that. And the future of work, which um, I think is one of the areas that was in the in the discussions, uh, Dr. Oswald over the last week on vocational training is, is so, so important. And I think we've lost a lot of time in, in, in that area, but it can also potentially have a very regional approach. And then my last point, and there are others, but I'm sure they'll come up in the discussion, is this becomes even more critical in a region where we are currently facing a number of, 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 of security challenges uh, or political challenges. Of course, we have the situation in Mozambique and Cabo Delgado. We're really concerned about that not getting out of hand and how we control that. Uh, we have the never ending cycle of, 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 of crisis in Zimbabwe. Um, we have a situation in Zambia and imploding debt, and then Tanzania plunging into authoritarianism. If, if all of those dynamics are not managed very carefully, and, us, and South Africa does have bandwidth problems at the moment, the region could change very materially in the, last, in the next decade. And I think partners uh, around economic and social issues, such as Germany and others, I think can play a really critical role in, in helping South Africa uh, uh, be a, a force for stability and, and, and hopefully prosperity in the region. Thank you, Elizabeth, very much. Virtual applause and uh, especially for highlighting uh, the, the, the current uh, state of uh, the South African foreign policy and also putting that into context where Germany and South Africa um, could um, cooperate. Also very important, I think, uh, to watch out what other fields of cooperation on multilateral level, especially in Africa, you mentioned Mozambique, for instance, and other countries, um, we, we have to have a look. And now I would like to uh, hand over to Dr. Melanie Müller, who is also well known to most of us. She's a researcher from the Stiftung Wissenschaft und Politik, a government think tank, and uh, very knowledgeable about Southern Africa, because normally she likes to spend a lot of time here, but because of COVID that is not possibly possible. I just would like to mention also to the, to, uh, the German audience that uh, the, the reports which Melanie Müller is writing um, are very well known also here in South Africa. So Melanie, what is your take on the uh, current state of the South African-German relationships and where do you see room for improvement? Yes, thank you very much, Henning. Thank you for the invitation and thanks to the other panelists. Uh, Elizabeth, I think it was at the end of February and we were sitting in Johannesburg talking about German-South African cooperation. That was when Chancellor Merkel visited the country. So um, I think it's great uh, to be back at least online uh, to talk about it again. Um, and I think I would probably repeat a couple of things that you said and that others said before. Um, 
But um, I mean, first of all, 2020 was supposed to be an important year for Germany and South Africa, um, as and I think Henning mentioned it at the beginning, both being non-permanent members of the UN Security Council, EU chair, AU chair, they were supposed to organize the EU-AU summit. Um, but then COVID-19 uh, changed a lot of plans, not, our, not only our personal plans or my plans to travel to South Africa, but especially the plans of all of our governments in order um, you know, to, to work together and, um, and um, things needed to be postponed, which means that the EU AU summit, for example, will be held under the presidency of the DRC or very likely. Um, so um, I think we'll have to wait uh, for for this um, next year. But um, I think still I would say that especially in the past year, um, from my point of view and from my observation, the cooperation between uh, Germany and South Africa has changed and it has clearly improved. Um, I mean, South Africa is the most important trading partner on the African continent for Germany. Um, but I think like others said before, shares common norms and values. And I think, and that is I think really important to mention that in the past year, it had a strong commitment to multilateralism. I mean, especially under the Ramaphosa presidency. And I think when you look at the geopolitical climate where so many other um, partners um, change their position. I mean, not only the US, but Brazil, India, I mean, facing um, or having with their new or different governments, they're not the partners that we had like 10 years ago. And I think, um, I mean, I sometimes wonder in another geopolitical climate, like 10 years ago, for example, how would we have dealt with this crisis on an international level? Because it might have been easier uh, with a US president, for example, um, who's, um, who would take it more seriously with a Brazilian government or an Indian government who would be able to react in a different way. Um, so I think um, it, it is important to also highlight that South Africa played an important role. And like Elizabeth said, um, I mean, we're think tankers, we, we should think critically, but at the same time, uh, when we look at uh, the leadership on the African continent this year, um, it was it was remarkable. And I think um, South Africa played a very important role as a EU chair. Uh, it's not, I mean, when you look at Europe, it's not very easy to unite different countries with different challenges, different economic challenges. Um, the pandemic unfolds in a different way, but um, somehow um, the African continent managed uh, to deal at least with the outbreak of the pandemic quite well. Um, there are severe socioeconomic challenges uh, that we will see in the next year. So I think this is the next step to really look at this. Um, but still, um, I think um, South Africa, um, you know, it was important to, to have uh, a EU leader who was able to do that. Um, at the same time, and I think it's no secret, and I'm a think tanker, so I can say it, um, South Africa is facing uh, serious challenges itself, a very difficult economic situation, which not only affects um, the country, but it also affects um, um, like companies uh, working there, um, the, the ESCOM crisis uh, puts a severe uh, uh, challenge uh, to the economy. And also, I think um, the Suma years have clearly um, undermined also the credibility of the South African government. And despite uh, we see these efforts um, uh, in, with, with, in dealing with corruption and so on, um, I often observe some kind of insecurity of other international partners, I mean, in Germany, but also in the European Union, because we still don't know if South Africa is going to continue uh, on combating corruption in the way that it needs to be. So I think what Mr. Oswald mentioned, the cooperation in that regard and the strong leadership in South Africa is really required to bring South Africa back again, because it's not back yet. Um, it's on its way, but it's not back yet um, from, from my point of view. Um, so I think when we look at what worked well in the past year, um, I mentioned already um, South Africa, I mean, the African continent was able to unite uh, uh, and also Ramaphosa was able to unite African leaders. Um, um, I think there is a strong African voice um, which um, was able to articulate needs and demands with regard to the pandemic, uh, also with regard to the economic situation. Um, South Africa was leading by example. Um, 
and also uh, the continent is trying to find a common response to the socioeconomic challenges. Um, I think also we, we didn't really talk about it yet, um, but apart from a pandemic, uh, there are various conflicts uh, on the African continent and South Africa has been a mediator in the past. It is trying to take an active role um, also in the United Nations Security Council, it was trying to mediate between different regions, sometimes voting with Western partners, but also voting uh, in a similar way than China and Russia, which, you know, sometimes interpreted or misinterpreted, I think this should be discussed later, as uh, not taking a proper stance on, on, on human rights and norms and values. But at the same time, I mean, when, when, when you observe what Dirko is uh, trying to present, so it wants to be an independent actor in international relations, not necessarily being associated with the West, but being a strong African actor and putting a strong um, African and South African uh, view. So I think this is probably um, uh, one area which uh, we, we could discuss later. Um, but, and I'm sure Henning, you will tell me soon that um, I'm running out of time. Uh, I think I have five points uh, like, future challenges, and I think we should talk about the future. Um, and um, I have five areas where I think cooperation between Germany and South Africa is possible and necessary. First of all, um, it's depth and the economic uh, situation on the African continent, because we see already that um, the pandemic and also um, the, the, the economic cooperation has changed not only supply chains, but um, various countries are facing a very, um, difficult, uh, so to say, economic situation. South Africa itself does. Um, so I think this is something that will shape European-African relations, not only next year, but in the next three, five years, um, um, because it's very likely that we'll face another um, global economic crisis and financial crisis. That is one area. Another area, it's really concrete, but I want to mention that it's the whole debate about supply chains, relocalization of supply chains, regional cooperation. Um, Elizabeth mentioned the African, uh, the, the, the AFCFTA, um, the free continental trade area. But I also think at the moment in Germany and in Europe, we have this, deb this debate on a law for responsible supply chains. And I mean, for me, the question is how do partners in the global South regard this discussion? What is necessary for them? South Africa is the biggest platinum exporter in the world. We know that in the platinum industry, the country was facing challenges with regard to the implementation of human rights. So I think this is one concrete area uh, where Germany and South Africa and also German and South African companies could work together because we will clearly see um, a, a stronger implementation of laws um, in, in, in Germany and in Europe with regard to, to uh, human rights and also responsibility in supply chains. Then Elizabeth had, has mentioned it already, but I want to mention it again because I think it's really important to look at the problems in Southern Africa. I mean, the situation in Zimbabwe is really difficult. It's not only an economic and financial crisis, it's a government crisis and the, South Afri uh, the, the Zimbabwean government is reacting in a more and more authoritarian way. Um, so I think it would be important to also take a look at that together. Um, and the violent extremism in northern Mozambique. Um, and I think um, Elizabeth also mentioned Zimbabwe and Tanzania, of course, but I think only with Zimbabwe and Mozambique, there is a lot of pressure on the region. And if those conflicts and, and problems cannot be solved, it will also put pressure on South Africa. Um, that brings me to my last two points. Uh, last one is democracy promotion. And I mean, not only in Zimbabwe, but in other countries, uh, um, countries in Africa, but also worldwide, governments use the pandemic in order to undermine democratic norms and values. So I think South Africa and Germany could work together and really um, take a look at, at, at these um, uh, challenges. Um, and then last but not least, that probably opens up a whole new debate, but the conflicts on the African continent and the role of external actors. And I think there is a chance because uh, South Africa has a different relationship with countries such as China, also with Russia, which is difficult for Germany sometimes. So I think uh, looking at the role of external actors in violent conflicts and maybe mediating, if possible, uh, uh, it, it, it is a challenge, uh, but something that I think could be done uh, if both governments agree that uh, this would make sense. 
I'll stop here uh, to leave room for discussion. Thank you, Henning. Thank you very much, Melanie. Also a virtual applause to you. Thank you also for your five points um, um, and reminding us um, where, we, where there is some room of improvement. Um, I see that we already have two questions. I would like the audience, please feel free to ask even more. I'm trying to pick up on that, uh, those questions and uh, give it to the panelists. But before um, I do that, I would like to ask um, Ambassador Dölga, who is the director for Africa in the Foreign Office in uh, Berlin, maybe to say some wor words on behalf of, uh, um, of the Foreign Office. Um, I don't know if he can hear us. Yes, there you are. Hello and welcome. I would like to ask you for a brief comment on regard uh, of the uh, regarding the the different um, uh, um, presentations which we yes. which we heard. Okay, thank you very much for having me, inviting me here. Um, and it's uh, so much material that I have problems in identifying what I should comment. But maybe um, would I I would like to start with uh, sort of following on what Elizabeth Sidiropoulos and Melanie Müller. Nice to see you all <laughs> um, have said, and uh, from where I'm sitting, certainly it looks as if um, South Africa, as if uh, President Ramaphosa certainly um, is called to lead in two ways. Uh, one, um, and that came out from Elizabeth's um, presentation very clearly, leadership in the region. And that I think Melanie Miller also emphasized that. Right? Uh, on the on Zimbabwe, on uh, Mozambique, um, on Zambia, uh, in the direct vicinity of, of South Africa, and that's where the the region is stable as long as South Africa is stable, and that is a huge challenge for uh, for the president Jomo The other one, other one is to lead at home, uh, to lead the country into reforms which are long overdue, to break up uh, some of the um, issues that have been building up. Um, so whilst, whilst the government is or he has to lead in the region, I have my doubts that he will be able to succeed on his own in South Africa. Um, he will need uh, support from outside. If you look at the figures as they are now, um, I would say um, there is little time uh, for real reform. And uh, in this, at this time, you need, uh, you need friends and partners. And, what I also can see is reaching out uh, to friends and partners and uh, his um, uh, uh, service, foreign service, also here present is Ambassador Sisani is, is very much doing so and also attempting to support this policy. And going back to what you have said on the, um, on the opening of, uh, for multilateralism, this is one remarkable element since I'm here in the last two years, our joint, uh, uh, so to the presence in the uh, UN Security Council, uh, of course, we are not always on the same line, but when it counted, I think we were able to count on each other. Um, the opening uh, also in the, uh, uh, in the presidency of South Africa in the African Union, now taking on the, the issue of GERD, um, taking on the issue of uh, now Ethiopia, uh, through key uh, issues uh, in the region. So it's a notable change of uh, approach. And of course, South Africa will remain within the AU Troika. So it will be able to, um, to also uh, shape um, uh, policy issues in Southern Africa uh, or in Africa in the next, in the coming year. Um, on the multilateralism side, of course, we have G20, um, where we work with South Africa, we have the com compact with Africa, we have the AU, UN, the WHO, uh, the, um, and of course the, the issues we did together in the UN Security Council. Uh, so this is, uh, this is all welcome and I see this as a evolving issue. We want to continue to work with South Africa in peace and security issues after the, um, uh, the end of our, um, so to say, joint presence in the Security Council and our presidencies. Last point, maybe on the on the future, um, AFCFTA. It's um, basically a huge uh, opportunity for South Africa. It's 
it's presenting its options on a silver plate. It's a country that will be able to make uh, most out of it if it if it uh, goes into the right direction and takes it on in a uh, positive in a positive way. And I think the German industry, the German partner, is one partner who would benefit most together with South Africa on that way because we are so working so closely together. Um, there's so many German companies. There's this knowledge of each other. There's the, you know, the, um, the good idea and uh, of working together. And of course, the issues and also energy, climate. Um, I think if we shape our agenda uh, and the, um, if I may say that the financial commission with South Africa is the most comprehensive we have, except the one with China, I would think. So uh, the full range of issues. So we can actually prepare also uh, this future cooperation and of course make a, an active contribution to the challenges ahead of us. And I leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Dölger. And I would like um, to ask a question regarding the economic state of South Africa. I think that also touches the question um, which we found in the Q&A box uh, from Wilfried Port, but also from uh, Dr. Hoffmann, MP in the German Bundestag. Um, South Africa is currently facing a huge financial burden. Um, at the moment, the current debt rate, the pace per day of new debt is about 2 billion rand. It's, it's a huge amount of money which South Africa has to borrow. But in order also to, to be able to, to, to shape the foreign policy, you need also the capability. Um, Elizabeth was pointing out uh, to the resilience um, which, is, which is needed. Um, Melanie pointed out uh, to all the different um, to all the different um, challenges in the region, and um, uh, Mr. Durga said the region is stable if South Africa is stable. Um, re referring now to the questions of Mr. Port and um, MP Hoffman, which we can see there, um, maybe first to Ambassador Cisani. How stable is South Africa, and how bad was was the COVID crisis? How how bad was it uh, regarding its uh, the economic potential of South Africa? And how do you see the plans from Mr. Ramaphosa to get out of the crisis? The, I think the I think the key issue is the ability of South African economy to respond to the pandemic in a way that pulled the whole nation behind one focused approach to overcome the crisis. And uh, it would have been worse than it was if President Ramaphosa did not initiate that style of his, of cooperation of all leaders of all sectors of society, including the capacity of the companies in the country to respond, even to change from their normal ability to produce uh, their goods and services into focusing on their ability to produce those uh, items that are needed for the fight of COVID. And, and for me, if it was not possible for the economy to be able to respond in that way, lockdown would have destroyed the economy, including killing people, but it, would, it, it, was an, it had enabled the country to respond positively. But the second issue that I'm, I'm encouraged <clears throat> is that even though the economy has been opened with the government uh, create, focusing on infrastructure to, and, and more new reforms to regenerate the activity of the economy, the South African companies' ability to expand their market into the rest of the continent will enable the economy to be able to respond, to generate the income that uh, is needed in order both to service the debts, but also to expand the scope of the ability of the, of the economy to, to uh, activate all those dead areas that uh, were uh, destroyed by the COVID. In my view, the, the, the resilience in the economy now moving into the energy uh, sector that is uh, away, moving, not moving away from coal, but increasing IPPs 
is enabling the economy to expand and respond to the ESCOM inability to supply the energy needed by the economy. Also the ability of companies to see the consistency in the ability of the economy to generate income and for them to have returns in their investments will give confidence in the government to support those companies that are generating income. I don't have any fears of the, for the future for the economy of South Africa. Thank you very much, Ambassador. And I would also redirect this question to uh, Dr. Oswald. Uh, given the fact that South Africa is so important for Germany, not only regarding the development cooperation, but also on the multilateral stage, and also to, to, to resolve all the different conflicts um, in, in Africa. Now South Africa is economically tumbling. The president is doing its best to uh, counter this, uh, this tendency, but what else can Germany do regard to help South Africa? Well, I think, uh, as I said already, Germany uh, has, uh, besides the cooperation BMZ uh, is responsible for quite a number of uh, uh, features uh, to, to assist South Africa. But uh, let's say it is always easy to look who, who from outside can assist. And I think I made it very clear, it is first the issue now, how, how to get the house sorted in a way uh, that, uh, uh, let's say, the mobilizing of domestic resources uh, is given a priority. Looking, looking let's say, on, on the history of, uh, especially the predecessor of the current President, uh, uh, I think uh, quite some resources uh, faded away, and but they didn't fade away in a way that they might not be recoverable. If one is serious, and that is, let's say, the background of the remark I made in my uh, statement, uh, is, uh, is also the reason I think Elizabeth also made it very clear. Uh, the earlier one. Is really underlining that uh, the fight against corruption and just looking now on the COVID crisis uh, with uh, let's say how many scams were uh, observed uh, in, in let's say the delivery of assist materials for uh, combating the COVID crisis I think with a bit more seriousness okay let's say it is also easier uh, and I think it is not the point alone, uh, let's say, with uh, uh, debt management, the difference between LDCs and uh, uh, middle income countries. I think one, one needs, uh, there is also not one size fits all solution. It is important to look, let's say, how, what's the structure of the debt, yeah? whom to approach, and so on and so on. Yeah? And um, I'm quite sure uh, uh, it is, of course, a big challenge, but one has to be also very clear, uh, let's say that the pandemic has accelerated the situation in a number of countries, but uh, let's say even the trend before was not leading towards that sustainability. Yeah? So these are the points one will need to be very clear about. Of course, Germany will flank everything uh, which is possible, let's say, in approaching African Development Bank, in approaching World Bank, in approaching uh, the IMF, if necessary, uh, to make the situation easier. Uh, but uh, let's say it's, it's not like uh, falling down like manna from heaven. One, one has really to, uh, to arrive at a solution which uh, is consistent in itself. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Oswald. I also saw that we have another, uh, some other questions regarding some, I would say, more domestic issues in South Africa. Mm -hmm. I will try to get back to that 
um, afterwards. First of all, I would like to ask Elizabeth and, uh, and Melanie, maybe first Elizabeth. Um, so we had um, in, this, this, in this debate um, the, the, the topic of uh, democracy and human rights uh, popping up. And um, we also heard today, we learned today, or, and we read it, read it before in the newspaper also, that not always in uh, South Africa and Germany had been on the same page regarding certain issues, uh, certain conflicts or certain um, approaches um, to, 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 to challenges in Africa, but also outside. Um, Africa. Um, I would like to ask you, do you think this is, um, this is an obstacle for further um, cooperation on multilateral uh, level that, that Germany and South Africa are not always on the same page? I liked actually the approach from Melanie who said, look, that also can be an advantage to have there someone like South Africa who, who might be more able to mediating. But um, I I, I, what about the obstacles? Um, Elizabeth, maybe you can say some words on that. Yeah, I think um, um, sort of having differences uh, in approach or, or, or taking different positions on, uh, on particular conflicts or particular global issues doesn't necessarily mean that you cannot continue the partnership. I like to think about it, maybe it is taking the analogy too far, but it's a bit like a marriage. You know, you don't always agree on everything, uh, but as long as you can find ways of dealing with the differences, uh, of creating mechanisms that might say, well, okay, on this particular issue, we agree to disagree. I would say that on one point, actually, Germany and South Africa are, are, pretty, uh, are pretty much on the same page, and that is that if we're talking specifically about conflict, I think the, 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 the position that both countries take, uh, um, and I don't know if there are any exceptions, Melanie can correct me, is largely one that focuses on diplomacy. Largely one that focuses on diplomacy first. That it's not about uh, you know, what we would say in South Africa, Skopskit and Donner, which probably the Germans can understand as well. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's not that kind of approach. Um, I think they're both, I would argue that both Germany and South Africa to a large extent, are diplomatic powers. Um, and I think that that forms a, a solid basis upon which, yes, you may disagree on, on approaches to certain things, but that doesn't necessarily obviate, um, obviate the, the opportunity for, uh, for collaboration. Um, you know, I think, I think Zimbabwe <clears throat> um, uh, is a particularly good example. And I think that requires really careful consideration now, particularly uh, after the American election to see whether that creates any openings where South Africa can work together with, uh, with Western partners, both, uh, both in Europe as well as, as with the US in terms of trying to, to create certain openings and to, and to get, in fact, both parties inside or the various parties inside uh, Zimbabwe and ZANU PF uh, to actually at least begin to talk to each other, because now we're, they're not talking to each other really. Um, so I think, and I think both countries are, are take that approach in international relations. We have to recognize that there are things we're going to differ on. And th those, those are virtue, by virtue of the fact that, um, you know, for example, Germany is a member of NATO. So there may be issues where we're not going to see eye to eye where, where NATO might be involved. You know, South Africa is part of the non-aligned movement and the G77. And, and that creates certain, you know, red lines on issues, but it doesn't, uh, it doesn't undermine our ability to work on issues where we do agree. Thank you very much, uh, Melanie. Um, yes, I, I think I would agree. I also uh, thought about uh, is it if it's uh, comparable to a mar marriage, uh, Elizabeth, but I think yes. I mean, it's a relationship, right? So you don't always agree. Um, I mean, it, it, it depends a little bit on what we talk about. I mean, I think it's it's difficult to, you know, to, to say that in general, because it depends on the conflict, um, or it depends on, on what is going to happen. But sometimes my impression is that it's not so much if you differ, but how you engage with each other and how you inform each other and how you include each other. Uh, so I think, um, and I'm not sure if the ambassador would correct me, but I think, um, I mean, there is at least from my observation, there is a different um, 
you uh, in, in Germany and also in Europe with regard to including African partners. And I think if that happens, uh, if you know they, they are included into, I don't know, negotiations or talking about a conflict in a very early stage, uh, it's, it, it leaves room for a debate and also to understand uh, those positions. And I think that changed um, a little bit compared to maybe 10, 15, 20 years on where uh, African partners weren't on the negotiation table sometimes or, you know, weren't part of the debate. So I think that, that this approach also changes uh, the relationship. Um, and then secondly, I mean, of course, there are different geopolitical locations. I mean, Europe is Europe uh, and it has a very particular uh, standpoint and um, South Africa is part of the African Union and the African continent is trying to speak with one voice. It's becoming stronger. Um, I think that's also um, that that also has changed. Um, and um, there is one similar norm in that sense. It's a commitment to regionalism or to, to like regional multilateralism, uh, which you don't often see in this world in, in such a strong manner, like in the European Union and in the African Union. So it's a similar uh, approach to conflicts maybe, but also to dealing with, with crisis. Um, but then at the same time, I mean, clearly China is one example, also Russia. I mean, the relationship uh, to China and Russia is it, it is just sometimes on a different planet, but it doesn't mean that it's necessarily a bad thing. Um, so I think one can also learn a lot from how South Africa regards its Chinese relationship, um, even if you wouldn't want to have it or if, if you don't agree or, or whatever but it is a different um, geopolitical relationship and also historical relationship that we have to accept uh, in, in Europe. So it, you won't change it, but you can understand it and also see how you work uh, with it. Thank you very much. Um, time is already uh, almost over, but I would like to uh, mention some of the questions which were asked uh, in the Q&A box. Um, and I would like to direct them first to, to Mr. Oswald and then to Ambassador Cisani. Um, one is, for instance, regarding the, the, the Section 25 of the South African Constitution, allowing expropriation without compensation. Um, uh, other, um, other questions are regarding the... the uh, or, regarding how to asking how to empower um, uh, the the willing forces in South Africa from civil society or maybe also from politics uh, for for reforming the the, the country um, Mr. Oswald how, how can we how can we as German um, with the German Development Corporation help South Africa to, to also with the promotion of uh, democracy, uh, democracy in South Africa. Obviously, we always respect uh, that South Africa is a sovereign country, but I see here from, from the questions that many people are concerned regarding, um, regarding even, if I may say so, the state of democracy in South Africa. How can development cooperation help here? Well, <clears throat> I think, uh, I have no concern with, the, with regard to democracy in, in, in South Africa. South Africa uh, has normally, uh, let's say, close to immaculate elections on, on different levels. I think this is not a challenge. Yeah? But uh, let's say it is also the, the challenge I see is that uh, let's say during the, the time uh, uh, before Ramaphosa, uh, let's say th there were certain trends developing, not only in the field of corruption, uh, but let's say protectionism, nepotism, and so on and so on. Uh, and let's say if one is allowing such trends for the future, in this regard, I see uh, a challenge for uh, a democratic or the continuation of a democratic setup. Uh, let's say I, I have been living in Zimbabwe uh, between the years 2097 uh, no, and 2001. Yeah? 
And it was really remarkable how fast you can go into a slide downwards uh, if, let's say, the respect uh, for the law, the respect for, let's say, proper procedures is no longer there. And there is a risk, uh, let's say, if uh, those uh, things are allowed to happen. Although South Africa has a vibrant civil society, people are really outspoken. And uh, let's say also if, uh, let's say the security organs uh, are improving a bit more on let's say, securing the personal security of the citizens. I think this is the challenge. And uh, let's say people have to feel safe. And then, of course, they, they have other dynamics uh, uh, with regard also to their economic activity. Yeah? So this is not uh, the point. With regard to, let's say, expropriation, normally, uh, uh, let's say, this is at least our philosophy, expropriation uh, must only happen if compensation is paid unless uh, this, uh, the, the material or the land expropriated was acquired illegally. And uh, these are points uh, uh, which I think are quite important. And also in this regard, we have made our uh, experiences in Zimbabwe. Let's say the farmers were expropriated who bought their land under the ZANU PF regime, yeah. So, yeah. So uh, let's say what one has to be very clear. And when somebody is talking about we are the sons of the soil, those people have not seen into the the Bushman caves in the Matokos. There were people before. Yeah? So it is let's say one has to be very clear about how one is communicating. Yeah? And uh, probably I'll leave it with that. Thank you. Thank you very much for those clear words. Uh, Ambassador Cizani, um, wh what do you say to, this, uh, to those worries, to those concerns people were asking? Well, uh, well, uh, well uh, I don't quite believe. I don't quite believe that the democracy in South Africa is under threat at all. And I, I think Dr. Oswald's uh, reply is adequate. People will have their own views about what they would like to see, but they have an opportunity to participate in the economy through political parties, through civil society, as individuals or as uh, cultural groups. That field is open in South Africa's constitution for people to be able to participate in a vibrant uh, um, democratic practices and procedures that are available. I have absolutely no qualms about that. When it gets to the constitution of the country, I think people have unfounded fears. I, I know for a fact that many people, when they read about what political parties and individuals say about the changing of the constitution, the constitution has safeguards, even in what can be changed and how it can be changed. There is a fundamental difference between the EFF, for instance, and the ANC in regards to the change of the constitution to allow for expropriation without compensation. It's fundamental. And even the, the, the non-movement of that bill through parliament currently reflects this precisely because the ANC would not break and destroy the constitution that were fundamental in creating a democratic system that we have now by uh, putting the spanner to the works, by expropriating all properties of individuals and groups or even companies that are entrenched in the constitution of South Africa. And, South Africa, and the ANC is very clear about that. And Ramaphosa's government will not be able practically to do it. There's another fundamental issue that many South Africans, sometimes even 
observers from outside do not understand that no bill goes through that parliament and gets signed by the president of the country unless the constitutional court uh, gives an okay in terms of its constitutionality. And there is absolutely no way the constitutional court can ever endorse a bill to become a law which will break the law itself. There is absolutely no way you could do that. I have no fears about uh, people being, and I think Dr. Oswald is very right in saying, the only people who could lose their land and not be compensated is if they acquire it wrongly themselves. But if they have proof that the land belongs to them, I can give you one particular small example for those in South Africa and perhaps those in, uh, in Germany listening to us, that in my town where I come from, there's a piece of land on, on a public state property, a national reserve, 400 hectares, is owned by individual. It has no title deed. It was given by Queen Victoria to a family, but they were never given a title deed on that piece of land. Till today, nobody has removed that family. It is exchanging uh, sales at 10 South African million rands between one to the next, because it can sleep 40 people per night in, in, uh, in the extent of the development of the property. It is safe. The state knows about it, but they are not expropriated. And I, I'm just giving you one particular example. Again, I, because I was a, a chair of the committee that deals with land and rural development in parliament for five years. I also know of many properties that were sold just before 1994 to individual families through trusts and the banks gave them money and the money was never repaid and the banks told, took the, the farms, but the farms belong to the state. But you can deal with those matters, but you can't deal with somebody rightfully owning a property which has got proof that it was obtained legally without compensation. There's absolutely no way you can do that. Yeah, thank you very much also for being so clear. I just would like to mention also to our audience, especially in Germany, that there's a very interesting report from the Motla from Motlante, the former president from his commission on land reform in South Africa. And it contains a lot of information about the difficulties. And uh, as we also heard from uh, Dr. Oswald, it's uh, the German um, position is also very clear. Um, I think this does not need any further um, uh, debate uh, in this forum at the moment. Um, time is uh, already over, so I briefly would like to um, thank all the panelists um, for making uh, the time available for being here with us. Um, I uh, also would like to apologize because um, I forgot to mention a very important thing in the beginning, and that is that this event is recorded. So if anyone <laughs> is objecting because of uh, data protection laws in Europe, if anyone uh, does not want to be recorded, uh, may it be uh, with a picture or also the questions, then uh, please reach out to us and we are going to cancel that. Um, but with these words, I would like to um, uh, to finish here and uh, give the word to uh, Dr. Friedrich, who is currently the head of the Africa Department um, in of the Konrad Adenauer Foundation in Berlin, uh, to do some um, final remarks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Henning. Um, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, it is definitely not easy to find the right words uh, here at the end of such an interesting and intense discussion. What we can say for sure, however, is that the topic of the webinar was well chosen, I think. We heard a lot about uh, South Africa as a strategic partner of Germany. We heard a lot about the potential of the bilateral relationship. However, there seem to be as well many challenges also to this relationship. For me, there are three takeaways from this exchange I just want to briefly um, uh, mention. Firstly, I'm very grateful to Ambassador Sizani that he put 
the bilateral relationship into historical perspective. I think that is always very important and it tends to be often overlooked. And also that you mentioned the importance of developing relations also on the sub-national level. The cooperation between North Rhine-Westphalia and Mpug Malanga had been mentioned several times. Secondly, I think it became very clear in all contributions tonight that there are common values and interests on both sides. It had been highlighted in the past, for example, in the peace building efforts in Libya, which had been mentioned uh, as well. But also, and as a representative of a political foundation whose motto is mission democracy, I'm very grateful to Melanie Muller who pointed out that promotion of democracy may also be one element of uh, a common goal that we, that we can strive for. And thirdly, last, what I want to mention is the statement of Elizabeth that our global governance system does need a fundamental shift and it does need to be reformed and that countries like South Africa and Germany may have common interest in working on this together. I think this is something that we also can take away from, from, this, uh, from this discussion and uh, it certainly needs quite a bit of, of work uh, here as well. There are certainly many more aspects from this discussion with, which would be worth mentioning, but I would like to limit myself to these. Before coming to an end, allow me to extend my thanks to several persons and institutions. First and foremost, of course, to our panelists, uh, His Excellency Ambassador Stone uh, Cizani, Dr. Stefan Oswald, Dr. Melanie Muller, and Elizabeth Sideropoulos. You made this wonderful exchange and, and thank you very, very much for this. Many thanks also go to your moderator of this evening, uh, to my friend and colleague Henning Zur. Thanks a lot, Henning, for, for making this uh, work so well. Many thanks also go to our co-host, the German South African Forum and its chairman, uh, Hans Werner Busmann. It has been, again, I must say, a wonderful cooperation with you and your colleagues, something we should be uh, should be uh, very happy to do again in the future. Last but certainly not least, I would like to thank one person who has not been on the screen, maybe sometimes he was running around uh, a little bit, uh, uh, but without whom this webinar would not have taken place. This is my colleague Tilman Feltes, Desk Officer for South Africa in the Department of Sub-Saharan Africa. Dear Tillman, thank you very, very much uh, for all the organizational work and making for making this happening. And for those who do not know already, uh, actually Tillman is leaving uh, uh, our, our department, or actually it's not leaving our department, but he is changing places. He will start uh, uh, his preparatory um, engagement for uh, uh, taking up the position of resident representative of the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung in Tanzania. So he will not be able to organize any more of these uh, <coughs> conferences on Southern Africa because he's moving uh, on uh, to, to Eastern Africa. Uh, good luck to you, uh, Tillman. And of course, I thank all of you for participating in this event. I do hope that you enjoyed it, this meeting as much as I did. I hope to see you again soon, preferably, of course, in person, but uh, as for de mieux, um, if necessary, then again in a virtual format. Stay healthy in these challenging times and all the best and good evening. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Good evening. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. <laughs>